This is Changeling the Podcast. Welcome to Changeling the Podcast. Come for the glamour, stay for the vibes. I'm your host, Josh, and with this is your other host, Puka. Say hi, Puka. No soy tha. What are we talking about tonight, Puka? We are continuing our march through Changeling the Dreaming 2nd Edition, although I suppose this is technically a bit of a detour into a separate line, Mind's Eye Theater, the live-action role-playing set of books from White Wolf. And we'll be talking about The Shining Host, which was the Changeling the Dreaming entry in that line. Joining us is special guest Pete Woodworth, author and eventual developer. So welcome, Pete. Hello. Glad to be here. I am so excited. (laughs) Both of us are excited. Um, I've said this before on the podcast. Changeling LARP is how I got into Changeling in the World of Darkness and LARPing, which I'll, I'll have big effects on my life over the years <laughs> like, <laughs> like how i met the mother of my children through larping mm-hmm. and like all this other stuff and yeah wow. it was a big big deal for me so i'm, I'm very excited to have it here and I'm, no no pressure or anything yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome i'm glad to hear it i'm glad to yeah. hear it i think this is one of the instances where josh you and i are kind of on complete opposite ends of the spectrum as I have never done any white wolf larping of any kind. <laughs> yep. Interesting set of perspectives. But I have deep respect for I've done a few other kinds of larp, but it was interesting to read through this book like purely in the theoretical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's uh, it's amazed me how much I'm not sure I actually ever sat down and read the book cover to cover before. I mean, we'll get into the thoughts at the end and stuff, but I do think, like, I mean, there's little nitpicks or something. I've got sort of oh, yeah. locker type things, but I mean, it's been how many? 25 years. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it holds up remarkably well. So. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. It was, it started me on a journey that is still going, but it was a very unlikely road at the beginning, let me tell you. Mm-hmm. very unlikely yeah. so speaking of beginnings can you talk a bit about how you got into well which came first changeling or larp maybe that's the better first question uh larp first i was the stereotypical theater kid who gets into larp so i'm the perpetual gm for my group and hmm. as i got into high school my group got larger and it got too large for tabletop games and we were all theater kids anyway So I bought the original box Mind's Eye Theater set, the one that had the fake fangs in it and everything. (laughs) Um, And we fell in love with it. So we started playing a lot of LARP. uh, And I was already into White Wolf at that point. Like I'd played White Wolf Mm -hmm. tabletop, but like I said, we had too many people. So I said, let's start doing LARP so that way we can all play. And high school basement vampire LARP is exactly what you think it is, is all I'll say. (laughs) (laughs) We had fun, but oh my gosh, it is everything that you would imagine that sentence conjures up. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Hashtag the 90s. (laughs) I didn't get into LARPing. Actually, I realized it would have been the year that this book came out, like at the tail end, when I first got into it. And it was already like a, these stories of the glory days kind of things of LARPing <laughs> by that point. <laughs> yeah. Mind's Eye Theater had already evolved a bit by the time this came along. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was it was one of the things. LARP was really not a thing back then either, or not much of one. Mm-hmm. Even in the gamer community, LARPers were the weirdos. We were like the anime kids of gaming. <laughs> which is which is funny because like when we interviewed Ian Lemke, like he was into LARPing before he got into <laughs> yeah. that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he ran a hugely successful like boffer game for years, and mm-hmm. like, I've heard legendary stories about that. Like his game was a is a legend in the boffer community. So dare I ask, and and I'm gonna say this this is for the sake of other listeners who may not have LARPed. What does boffer refer to? Oh, boffer is the uh, the type of LARPing where you see people running around with fo- like foam covered plumbing supplies uh, hitting each okay. other. Yeah. Now um, nowadays they have all these fancy latex. Oh yeah, true. Injection true. molded, but. <laughs> 
I had kids yeah. when that came before that came out. <laughs> so I never... Yeah, I've I've played in ones that have the foam weapons. There's ones that are like fabric covered foam. There's latex weapons. It's it's gotten ornate, but yeah, the mm-hmm. basic idea is run around and hit each other with stuff, as Got opposed it. to Minds Eye Theater, where you're not supposed to hit each other at all. Yeah, I, I'd I'd argue that LARP has more diverse styles and movements in it than even tabletop role playing games. Oh like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd 100% agree on that one for sure. The only style that I've that I could claim to have done is Nordic LARP, which oh. I have all kinds of thoughts and feelings about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I I encountered Nordic LARP uh, years and years ago at a Dreamation here in New Jersey, and I played a game called Under My Skin, which was inspired by some nordic larp and mm. i've since played in a whole bunch of the nordic or now there's american freeform which is like the american version of nordic larp and yeah and, i uh, think i think it actually pre it's weird the, the, the larp genealogy gets <laughs> <laughs> yeah well so one of our listener comments from discord is that charlie cantrell told us that we should ask you how you got the job of writing shining host because apparently it's a doozy Oh gosh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Charlie would know. Um, all right. Uh, so here's what happened: is um, I was a junior in high school, and we had been running Vampire for like a year or so. We also ran like a werewolf game, but Changeling just came out, and I fell in love with it. Like it was, you know, it was such a it was such a big departure for White Wolf. This full color book, and everything's bright. And as Ian will tell you, the bears with balloons thing has never left this (laughs) this game. (laughs) Um, But I I loved it. And I really wanted to run a changeling game as like a going away present for my friends. For like senior year, I wanted to run a changeling LARP. But there was no book. They announced that somebody was writing the book, but it wasn't going to come out in time. So like Mm. the summer before senior year, I wrote a bare bones version of a rule book. Like just, just the rules basically to play all the kits, to do all the arts. Like I spent part of my summer just writing a basic skeleton rule book. And my girlfriend at the time, who's also credited, she's credited in as the uh, character sheet designer in Shining Host. Yeah. Uh, all of the play testers are my friends from high school. That is who play tested this book. Because we started playing. She's like, this is really good. You should send it to them. I'm like, they already have somebody writing the rule book. And she's like, well, maybe they'll hire you for something else if they see it. And like, she finally got me to do it. She, we ran off a copy at Kinko's. She photocopied some of the pages from the tabletop game and colored penciled them for chapter dividers, <laughs> like some of the, the chapter illustrations. We sent this monster thing to White Wolf and their submission guidelines at the time were like a cover letter and two pages. And I sent 128 single space pages. <laughs> Um, so like it is the poster child of not what not to do. And what I found out much later, I didn't, I didn't realize this at the time, but, uh, Rich Dansky was running Minds Eye Theater at the time. And Rich is a good friend. He actually grew up around where I grew up myself, but the guy who was writing Changeling the week before my, my submission showed up quit and took everything with him apparently i think he even had like a religious conversion or something and burned his copy like he left in, with a capital l oh um, man and it That's was like the second yeah. changeling writer to do something like that but yeah name apparently names. or first of two <laughs> they were yeah. putting it yeah yeah and they were only a couple months out from when they wanted to get this thing in layout and everything and my submission landed on his desk in that in the week <laughs> after he lost his writer and was panicking. Here is a bare bones skeleton book that is like almost fully formed. Yeah. It needs all the fluff and, and all the, you know, the storytelling chapters and stuff, but like, here's a rule book that just landed on his desk. So he called me up and I was home alone that day and I was still, I was 17 and he called me up and said, would you like to write for us? And uh, I said, oh, of course, you know, I, I freaked out. No one's home though. I want to tell somebody. I ran to my girlfriend's house, like two miles away <laughs> and told her. And he's like, but you can't tell anyone other than like your family and maybe your girlfriend. And I eventually had to tell one of my friends because he put the rules up on our website for our game. So he had to take them down and he wanted to know why. So I eventually had to tell him, but the rest of my friends had no idea what was going on. 
So they did this play test for this game. And when it finally came out, they found out when I brought a box of books to the party, <laughs> and just handed out their, their play tester copies. So, and that's how I got started was Rich said, you know, if you, if that thing had showed up a week earlier, I would have tossed it because I didn't need it. And a week later, I probably would have already hired someone else and had them under contract. So, wow. Uh, issue timing. What's the official term for a bunk that somebody <laughs> else performed to <laughs> enact your, your dawn? That's I, I just think this is like the reverse of the Wraith curse. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, you're not wrong there, I suppose. But like where the book magically appears instead of gets deleted from the hard drive. So, I mean, it was sheer dumb luck uh, that got me the gig uh, for Shining Host. And yeah, I wasn't even legal when I signed the contract. Uh, they found that out later. <laughs> so I was still 17 when they sent me a contract and I didn't know any better. So I signed it and sent it back. And my dad's always really proud. He always makes me tell this part. He's, they found out later because it was ne getting near the end of the year. My deadline was in June for the final draft. And this was back when we still had to like send red lines by post, you know, by mail and they print out you know, things with red lines and I'd get them and I'd type them up and send them back. And, and I was talking to Rich and I said, you know, can I get an extension for a week or two? I'm graduating in June. And he said, Oh yeah, yeah. You're, you've been ahead of schedule. That shouldn't be a problem. And I said, you know, it's going to be so weird to be leaving high school. <laughs> and there was a pause on the other end of the line. He went high school. <laughs> I said, yeah, what? He thought I was in college. My dad is very proud of that part. Mm -hmm. um, he told me later he was going to offer me a job when I graduated. <laughs> and then he found out I wasn't in college. So he called my parents. I was like, did you know he was doing this? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know. Was he legal when he signed it? They're like, we're not worried about it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that did is they why. make you sign something else when you turned 18. <laughs> yeah, they sent me an updated contract, but <laughs> it was a it was hell keeping that secret though from my friends for like a year. Um, that was so oh. hard to do. Um, and all the sample characters in the book, the fiction, all of that are all my friends' characters from the game. Is that pictures of them too, or is that others? No, no. We, we okay. actually, a friend of mine did send in artwork. She sent in photographs mm -hmm. of us at the game, and some of the pictures they used are similar to some of hers, but they didn't use her her work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, <laughs> that's the crazy origin story. Don't do what I did, kids. <laughs> it's not generally going to work. <laughs> you kind of even can't do that anymore, I think. Like, well, you definitely yeah. wouldn't want to mail it. Well, yeah. Weird. That too. I mean, as a developer, I would toss things that didn't fit the guidelines. Because mm -hmm. if they can't follow those rules, I'm not hopeful about how well they'll do mm -hmm. following edits and things. So... It's just interesting, though, to think about... I mean, when we, when we spoke with Charlie before, Charlie mentioned... Uh, getting involved with C20 by basically emailing and saying, hey, is C20 going to happen? And it was, yeah, do you want to write for it? Like that kind of just, <laughs> you have to take that initiative and cross every digit you can, I guess. Yeah, I mean, my very, very first gaming writing thing was another one like that. My first gig was writing for the old West End Games Star Wars RPG. Wow. Um, like the old D6 Star Wars game. And they had a magazine called the Star Wars Adventure Journal and they had an author call in it. And my dumb little 15-year-old self is like, I bet I can do that. <laughs> so I sent in a thing and I got hired because <laughs> so, nice. I didn't know any better. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, well, Charlie also had the advantage of being beloved in the community for many years. So that, that definitely also helps. But yeah, he was one of the torchbearers for Changeling for a long time. Yeah. So yes, um, shall we dive in to, well, we start with some mimes. Unseely mimes. <laughs> oh jeez yeah so this is opening fiction here uh one enchanted evening a cautionary tale i think it's a it's a pretty good little short story it's about a cop who stumbles into a battle of at a freehold from a group of unseely mimes it's all in character description so yeah <laughs> unseely mimes trying to take over a presumably <laughs> seely freehold and then getting enchanted and titled by the end <laughs> There's some yeah. interesting questions raised here. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, he's a. Uh, that was sort of me kind of doing a favor for a, a friend's character because all of these people are player characters from the, mm -hmm. from the play test game. And of course, Brendan Bomain, if you're familiar, shows up much yes. later as the leader of House Bomain. 
Um, he was my original NPC that I played for the first Changeling arc. And uh, back when he was in House of Lunid and before we revealed Bomain. So Anthony Marks, the, the cop, was one of my friends who wasn't sure he wanted to play Changeling because he thought it was a little weird. He was a white wolf mm-hmm. guy. So he's like, can I play just like a, a human? I'm like, sure and he wound up being a knight anyway like he got knighted for his service to the freehold so uh, well that answers that question it didn't happen that like, quickly but we we can yeah. some things for uh for this yeah make sure when you're running a larp here if an actual cop walks in do not them. <laughs> <laughs> i have some horror stories about people interacting yeah. with police at larps so yeah <laughs> um. well this is maybe a good segue um into chapter one because we sure. start probably very importantly with the rules and <laughs> mm-hmm. i am curious again having limited experiences with larp how many of these like how stringently these are observed so no touching no stunts no no drugs or drinking etc uh... yeah for most of the games i've been to these become somewhat flexible if people know each other better um, mm, yeah. but they're they're there so that you can point to it and say No, like if someone wants to come up and throw their Mm -hmm. arm around you or give you a creepy hug, you can be like, no, no touching. Yeah, the no touching, I'm not going to say it's yet, it's absolute, people know each other, that kind of thing. But I'd say it's more stringent than hanging out with people not LARPing, for sure. Or at a tabletop game, definitely more stringent than that. The no drugs or drinking, no being drunk, definitely. But I've played LARPs that like, you rent a bar. Yeah. And there's sort of an expectation. There's a bit of drinking for people who do drink and you're buying yeah. non-alcoholic drinks. if You're not a drinker, but mm. yeah. yeah. Like these were the standard rules that were in the front of every mind's eye theater book, yeah. you know, lightly okay. adjusted for flavor for changeling, but um... yeah. And, and when you get into boffer LARPs talking about other hands of LARP, mm. that's when like the no drinking is way more strict because uh, yeah, at least if it's not be very careful considering yeah. going back. Yeah. But most of these, yeah, I would say they're generally, they exist a lot of the time for when you're when you're LARPing with strangers so that mm-hmm. everybody's got a comfortable baseline. And if I choose yeah. to say, hey, I don't mind if you shake my hand or hug me, a lot of games will say casual contact is okay, like handshakes or th- like something you could do in a professional environment, like shake someone's hand is fine, but... When you're at a convention with a bunch of people you don't know, these, oh, are, yeah. these are usually followed a lot more than a, a friendly home game that's like invitation only. Mm. Mostly the other thing is like one of the things I tell people is a lot of these rules, people are like, well, what, you know, can I like, can I put my arm around my girlfriend? And real, you know, and I'm like, most of these rules exist because other people might see it and think that means it's okay for them to do. They don't know that you yeah. two are dating. So like they take their cues from other players. So it's not that I don't. Yeah, especially you. when two characters are dating like oh i'm fine with dating your character i i'm not okay with certain things yeah Yeah. Mm. no makes sense there was a game that was somewhat notorious in our region it was a great game for a long time but it would also a lot of the games eventually sometimes you wouldn't be able to do any rules resolution because all the sts would be drunk and (laughs) yeah yeah that's when it starts crossing the line for me like if you do a little light social drinking most larps don't care um, as long mm-hmm. as it's in a place where that's safe to do but yeah like we were getting to the point where like we literally could not resolve rules tests because all the sts were were blasted and we're like oh this is again i'm gonna have to send a text after this recording and, uh, <laughs> you probably know the game i'm referring to but yeah it was one of the only large changeling games in the area of south jersey so yeah and there's other rules that you'd think are implied and aren't like no exchanging xp for certain favors mm-hmm. uh, that have come up oh, to no. not games i've been in again it's the people talking about all oh, those other games yeah i always like the fact that like you know sometimes people would make fun of these sorts of rules i tried to add a rule that you should use basic hygiene but they shot me down <laughs> um like <laughs> just like like deodorant and breath mints or gum but they're like that's a little rude i'm like yeah but have mm-hmm. you but been important. to a convention game <laughs> <laughs> and this this is a wide variety of places this is used in between like a group of friends in a basement versus we're renting a bar versus this is a university campus and the university does not allow preventing people from playing in the game who go to the university like there's a big yeah and that's actually one of the consistent challenges when i was designing minds i theater when i was writing and later when i was developing was that 
rules that work for groups of friends aren't necessarily good for 300 strangers in a, mm-hmm. in a huge convention game and vice versa. And I always tried to write towards groups of friends, you know, smaller games of friends playing who trust each other because that's the kind of game I like. I like it when I trust people and I'm never, I've never been very paranoid about trying to prevent cheating when I write rules because Mm -hmm. people who are going to cheat, I can't stop them. So I'd rather write rules that are fun, but might be exploitable sometimes because I can always just tell someone no. If, if they try and exploit a loophole in my rules, I can just be like, no, thank you. Yeah. Like I, I've always had more trouble with people just being like, oh, I don't care. Yeah. just explicit cheating. Like, did you spend those traits? They're like, I don't know. Yeah. People just not bookkeeping. Yeah. Um, yeah. People showing up without a character sheet and being like, I want to play. Yeah. I mean, we literally, we were playing a game at one point we were, we were playing and we had, it wasn't this changeling game, but it was another game I was running and we had a troll show up who deliberately tried to disrupt the game. And I just tossed him. He's like, you can't do that. I'm like, yes, I can. I'm running the game. Get out. He had like tried to kill some other player characters and I brought them back to life because I was like, that guy didn't count. We're just going to roll that back. Like, don't let him have his fun. When you say um, troll, do you mean troll or troll? <laughs> I or mean both? the more conventional ter- use of the term. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, no, we had we had some players who showed up just to try and screw with our LARP and mm. have fun and kill other people's characters for no reason except they were bored. And I just chuck them. You know, I don't have any patience for players mm-hmm. like that. To be yeah. fair, I've seen that happen around non-LARP tables as well. So, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am curious, though, because so you do have a section in here as well where you talk about having narrators who are kind of, I suppose, assistant mm-hmm. storytellers in a way. Yep. It says uh, the eight of one narrator for every 10 players makes for a good ratio. So I'm curious, I guess, for both of you, what is the largest game, changeling or otherwise, that you've ever played in or narrated or been storyteller for? Uh, played in... 50 something players in a session it was a boffer larp though that was um at, like campground kind of thing i think it was like 50 or 60 players plus like a lot more than six staff actually for that but boffer larp's different how many staff you need they called it staff instead of mm. you know uh, yeah, yeah i think running the largest session i got was like 25 in a changeling larp or something mm. playing in for me boffer larp i was at a 1200 person game once <laughs> i played in it was a game called dystopia rising it's a zombie apocalypse game yeah. and they have or they used to I'm, i haven't played in, in years now but they had national events where all the chapters from all over the country would show up mm-hmm. and there were about 1200 people on the campground at one point and yeah i i know in the uk and europe you can get like games that regularly have worth over 5000 people yeah drakenfest in germany draws five six thousand people um and mm-hmm. the U.S. one drew almost a thousand. I was pl- I was playing in that last summer. It was the first year, so that was a good turnout. But the largest White Wolf game I ever ran was a three hundred person changeling game at a convention. And, oh, beautiful. Uh, we were part of we were part of a larger game. It was a multi world of darkness game, and I ran the changeling side of it. And we had about three hundred people. It was huge and sprawling. And basically, I was allowed to bring staff. Um, I brought my own narrator team with me and. One of my claims to fame in the White Wolf community was that I ran a 65-person Mind's Eye Theater combat in 10 minutes. And oh, nice. <laughs> I'm very good at running combat. This directly ties into questions I have later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have a question for you, Pete. Um, I know you, you sort of described it sounds like both of these, but like, is there like a, a roughly even mix or siding one or the other for one-off LARPs versus ongoing Chronicles or whatever structure you want to call it? I mean, do you, do you mean like... What, like in terms of what you've done running or... Uh, most of the games I run are ongoing. Okay. I don't tend to do a lot of one-off LARPs. I do one-off tabletops relatively often. Mm-hmm. But like a lot of my LARPs started as we'll do this once or twice and wind up running for yep. a few years. But most of what I do, I do I do Chronicle style because I, I like yeah. ongoing stories. Although all of my Chronicles I build towards a specific end because Mm -hmm. everyone's got their own thing, but I like a story to have an ending eventually. And I've seen a lot of world of darkness games that just kept going for years and years and years. And, you know, I like a lot of the time the people are kind of, 
they're not even really there anymore except that they're there hanging out with mm-hmm. their friends which is cool but like they don't really care about the game anymore because they've been you cool. might as well start a new larp with the same people yeah exactly like yeah like start start a new game with the same people like give those stories a conclusion you know move and on. there's definitely mechanically i've seen it more happen in vampire you do get to a point where it's just there's too much xp on these sheets like there's no it doesn't the system doesn't work anymore yeah power it's, creep is a tremendous problem especially in minds of theater where you didn't have a whole lot to spend your xp on yeah the, the underwater basket weeding lore <laughs> fair yeah so the rest of chapter one we kind of have a distillation of the setting the history etc of changeling the dreaming and i think it's actually if you were a new player to the game in general it does a decent job of summarizing a lot of it Mm -hmm. the metaphysics a little bit we have the history we have the kiths and the chimerical world how the society works and one of the things that was really tricky was you can also see me trying to cram in as many source books as i can yes because mm-hmm. i was an overachiever so there's mention of like the ninahe there's mention of like i was trying my my darndest to to squeeze in every changeling book i could i was just happy to see the kilo duo in there yeah i love them my brother played one for a long time and, excellent uh, yeah the way that we put the book together in part we got a a follow-up book we got the player's guide because of all the cut material from this book <laughs> mm-hmm. they came back to it years later and we're yeah. like okay which we will be doing an episode on uh, <laughs> okay well i'm i'm here for it i'm i'm How's that? That, it, if you look at the list of play testers for the player's guide that's all my friends in college um ah. so. <laughs> i have used the shining host and the player's guide for when i'm running a tabletop game and there's people around and we're like a session zero and there's just a lot of there's like some of them just have no experience with change or even the world of darkness. And I'm like, here, you can read this while the other people are doing stuff. Yeah, at the table ex- top book. exactly. I mean, because it is really it's thorough, but it keeps moving quickly. And I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can also tell what music I was listening to. Yes. At, at 17. Uh, with the obligatory White Wolf music quotes. Uh, oh, yeah. Because like you have a, there's a Mighty Mighty Boss Tones one yep. in one of these chapters. And like. I think that was the year I saw them live at an HMV in Toronto. So, like. <laughs> yeah, that was, the, that was the same year I saw them for the first time on tour. Yeah. So. And like they cut like nine more music quotes because I was so like, yeah. you know, because all the White Wolf books were coded in music quotes back then. I also note with interest, I didn't realize this at first, but this actually came out before the Mage Mind's Eye Theater book, Laws of the Ascension. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hadn't Every, everyone had been saying mage minds eye theater was literally impossible before yeah. it came out mm. jess jess heinig found was brilliant in the way he figured out how to do it mm-hmm. but that's a that's a whole other set of stories because yeah, yeah that was a... considered like the unlarpable game by yeah. so many people mm-hmm. for so long which is surprising because like changeling arguably is at least <laughs> well, a, should have on paper is, been a... like in my experience like because i you know i became line developer for minds eye theater and then they switched over to the new world of darkness and I was line developer for minds. Eye theater for a while there for Requiem and, and the, the minds. Eye theater book and changeling was always the second most popular LARP after vampire. Once it came yes! out. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I, I, I yeah. kept saying that and was like, I don't believe you. And I'm yes, like, I, I, it has to be true. Just based on when I see like you'd occasionally see a werewolf LARP, you'd hear rumors of an oblivion, but, <laughs> but it makes sense in a way when you think about how, within the setting of the game, how mortals would perceive changelings doing changeling things. These mm-hmm. days, at least, I feel like it's penetrated the public consciousness enough that you could be like, oh, there are those LARPers again. Yep. And changeling also, be, like, changeling has so many metaphors for gaming itself mm. and, like, and the experience of being a gamer. And you can do changeling in public by just being like, we're in our mortal seemings, you know? And, like, mm-hmm. we would do the play in public thing where we go to the mall or go, you know, on a trip somewhere... And people would have, they would have fun coming up with little details to like, you know, for their kith to like, you know, the red cap, of course, would have a red cap on and like, no. but other people would do like little things like the slow, I would darken under their eyes a little bit. Hmm. So, you know, we're weird if you look close, but you can play it in public. And unlike like vampire, where if you're doing full makeup, you will stand out. Mm-hmm. And I mean, cha- changing also, yeah, the whole mortal self, chimerical self, imagination, it it lends itself beautifully to LARPing. And, you know, we were famous for going to the PA Ren Fair and in character every year. Um, 
Oh. And we'd always find at least one other changeling player who would recognize our tabards and our house colors and things. <laughs> I am devastated that I never saw that there because I used to go every year as well. But oh, damn it! <laughs> so yes, chapter one is we actually in our um, initial second edition materials and Book of Lost Dreams episode we talked about the intro like quick start simplified rules and everything for second edition. I would go so far as to say that the write-up in here does a better job because it's less invested in preparing people to play Changeling the Dreaming, and it's more invested in getting people into the headspace of playing a Changeling, which are two different things. I appreciate it. That's what I was going for. So that's that's good to know. Yeah. Interesting thing reading this book, and especially when you consider what hadn't, hadn't come out beforehand, it's more... I'd say more than any of the tabletop changelings, it's got a little bit more bend towards crossover play with like player mm. character things. Yeah. And I think that, I don't know if that's more or less true than in tabletop, but I it's m- definitely a lot of LARPs I played in, somebody's playing, if there's enough people, somebody's playing something not from that game. Exactly. Yeah. Mo- that, part of that was, yeah, was our experience was like, like I said, we had one person who played a human. One of my friends wanted to play a vampire. And, mm-hmm. you know, and we had one person who wanted to play a mage. And so like, we've tried to figure out how to simulate him. That was, that was its own project, but like, and I, m- so many of the world of darkness LARPs are crossover games. Mm-hmm. They really just are like, cause people yep. love mixing them, even though tabletop, it happens far less. But, mm-hmm. um, so I, that was my experience from running vampires. We have people who wanted to play werewolves in our vampire game and, and other stuff like that, or a ghost. For some reason, person. somebody always wants to play a Korax in any LARP. I don't, I don't understand it. There's, what is wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I'll brook no anti crow sentiment in this podcast. They, they fit in in almost every game. <laughs> yep. so they work in Wraith. They work in Vampire. They they work they in Changeling. Change okay. yep. um, yeah. They're my favorite splat I've never played. So. <sighs> See, you can also tell if you read carefully that I have a soft spot for were coyotes. So I, I, I did know. notice, yes, the Nuisha make an appearance. It's like, oh, yeah, right. yeah, they're close to my heart. So excellent. So then we get into a very a chunky chapter. Uh, yeah. So you mean most of the book? Uh, yeah, chapter two. yeah, <laughs> nearly half the book, which is chapter two, character creation. As someone who is frankly a noob to this entire system. Can one or both of you briefly describe the traits and challenges system, I guess, and how yeah. that Well, I just want to start. It, it, it leads you into a false sense of security if you're tabletop. It does. You read, yes. you read through the, the summary, and it's almost identical to the yeah. tabletop system. <laughs> like, I know all this. <laughs> yeah. And then you start looking at the birth rates and frailties, and you think, wait, something's, something's off here. And then... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I got in so much trouble for merits and flaws for this game. Oh I got no, in so much trouble. Uh, for we it. got a comment from somebody saying how much they loved merits and flaws compared. They hadn't read this before; they only knew tabletop, and they're like, "Oh, this is really good." So, <laughs> yeah. well, most of the changeling players loved it, but Rich had such a need to turn it around quickly. He did a great job. He's a fantastic editor, but he didn't know changeling as well. And he didn't mm. realize that I slipped in a lot of new merits and flaws that did not exist in tabletop. Um, uh, I just have to say, I love the legacies. <laughs> like I'm realizing why in like these online arguments or something where people are like talking about Sealy versus Unsealy, I'm like, have such a different view. I love the take on them in this, where you have these Sealy legacies and some of them are not great people and Unsealy legacies where some of them actually are pretty decent, could be decent people, right? Yeah. It's, it's a much more balanced and it was slightly different take on what the court mean i just love it you can see a lot of the seeds of what we would wind up doing in in changeling 20th but that's that's mm-hmm. way down the line um mm-hmm. but so the trait system um yes so the idea with mind's eye theater which was slowly changing even when this was written is that you had physical mental social just like tabletop of world of darkness games but instead of just having point like numerical values, you had to pick adjectives for each category. And you were only supposed to be able to initiate a rules contest if you had an adjective that was relevant. Hmm. So 
this was something a lot of groups very quickly overlooked and they would just say physical Mm -hmm. challenge or mental challenge or whatever. And you would literally just compare the number that you had in that category, your total. But in theory, what you were supposed to do is be like, I am clever enough to slip by you without you noticing. And you'd be like, I'm observant enough to catch you. And then we would do rock, paper, scissors. And if we tied, then we would compare who had more, you know, if um, if that would be a mental challenge. So if you had six mental traits and I had eight, I would win on a tie. And then there's the the negative trait, which even more got, people would take it for the points, but the, (laughs) they almost never got invoked. Oh man. Um, Yeah. I like it. I think breaking it down into just numerical things, not just loses flavor, but I think it loses some complexity that's useful if you treat this as a some sometimes competitive game. Yeah. But the problem is just remembering which traits you spent. Like right. it's really hard. <laughs> because when you lose when you lose the challenge, you temporarily lose that trait. So if you if I beat you, you say I'm observant and I say I'm clever and I win the test, you lose observant from your sheet for the rest of the session or until you spend willpower you can refresh a category Mm. and get all your traits back and the idea was to try and encourage that you couldn't necessarily do everything yeah by picking adjectives if you don't have adjectives that make you a good fighter you could still be very physical but you wouldn't necessarily have a lot of traits that would apply to punching someone in the mouth because reading through it it definitely it read to me like and i didn't do like a comparison or anything but it it seems more like you're taking specialties instead of dots in attributes Mm -hmm. yeah and i have played in games that did stick to it yes and i think it worked well Hmm. yeah if people could remember what they spent and that was the yeah that was the part is um i have always been a fan of minimal prop larping Hmm. like minimal bookkeeping like you know, LARP systems that require you to carry around a lot of stuff, especially don't generally work too well in my mm-hmm. experience in the long term. There are exceptions. I mean, obviously, you know, my experience is not universal, but um, the pro- that was the problem with Minds Eye Theater is if, unless you stop to cross something off with like a pen or a pencil, it was very easy to forget what you had spent and honest, make an honest mistake, not even counting the people mm-hmm. who conveniently forget that they lost two traits in a challenge yeah. not to mention spending willpower spending glamour yeah. gaining banality yeah yeah there's and we used little slips of colored paper for glamour and banality and willpower like a lot of games At one point we bought um you can like go to a dollar store and get like those rows of like tickets that they sell and get different colors of those for each yeah and it was it was really cheap and effective way of doing it yeah all right I keep wondering if something with smartphones could be used today. But... Oh, that I, you got a couple hours because I have ideas about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe we could find a way to talk later. If that sounds good. <laughs> but surely that would take some of the well, maybe not take some of the fun out of it, but it would certainly change the timbre of the game if people were like it, checking their it phones. Definitely would. To... Yeah, that's the other problem too. Yeah, you'd be getting oh, I just got a message. And, yeah, oh, I just got yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. people have people have done AR and augmented LARP games and stuff before. I've seen some really cool ones and, and or mm-hmm. used phone systems and things. But like, part of the the original appeal of Minds Eye Theater was that you shouldn't have to carry around anything other than your character sheet, which you could fold up and fit yeah. in a bra or a pocket, mm-hmm. like and your hand or, or your hand. Yeah, like that was why they were originally in quarters, so you could fold them into quarters mm-hmm. and and still be useful and like. Eventually, Minds Eye Theater got further and further away from that. Mm. And I mean, there's good and bad to that. I mean, original Minds Eye Theater was very simple to the point where sometimes it could feel very arbitrary mm. um, because you had a one in three chance of winning anything. You know, like yeah. I have a one in three chance of punching out Bruce Lee, you know, in theory, <laughs> if I just do rock, paper, scissors. Ah, but um, then there's the overbid. That, well, yeah. I did read yeah. this. Yeah. I probably. And the ability retest <laughs> and the willpower retest. And <laughs> yeah, There's one thing I'm not sure if you noticed, Puka, was the background. Did those stand out to you as oh, odd? Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, even before getting <laughs> to that, though, I, I wanted to say for, for clarification for anyone who hasn't read the book. Uh, so in addition to attributes being replaced by this list of traits, which are more like specialties, but you do still choose 753 along physical, mental, social. Yep. So then abilities you choose, I guess you can choose five or choose a certain ability more than once and yes. 
Mm -hmm. It's a somewhat streamlined version, but I was very glad to see Scrounge in there as one of the options, which I think was like a player's guide to <laughs> secondary yeah. ability. Oh, that gets used so much in LARP. Yeah. yeah. It's not even funny. Yeah. It's like overpowered. I love it. <laughs> it, it. Addressing a thing that comes up in, say, our sister podcast, uh, Mage the Podcast, but when you have these overlapping sub abilities, I just realized reading through this, it's not a problem in this system because right. it's not how many dots you have, like rolling. It's. Right how many can you spend? And it's like, oh, if it happens to overlap, you just choose which of them you're spending for the retest. Yeah. So I can probably use, I can use repair in place of crafts for certain challenges. If I'm fixing something, I could plausibly yeah. use either skill. Um, mm -hmm. But And it's just if, an advantage to have both then. Yeah, not... because I can't build something necessarily with repair, but it would let me save my craft skills for when I'm making something and then use repair when I'm fixing. You know, like, yeah, mm -hmm. so the, the overlap was intentional in the skills so yeah we the the streamlining of minds eye theater the the design was that you know it was supposed to be as math light and rules light as possible uh, and and to keep people to keep the game moving was the ultimate goal mm -hmm. um of of minds eye theater to keep it moving as fast as possible and it doesn't always succeed at that to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest but that that's the goal that we'd shoot for yeah. well i mean it I would be curious enough at this point to give it a try because it seems to me like it does fulfill that goal just from this book, at least. Yeah. I mean, if you're comparing against what we talked about boffer LARPs before, those <laughs> are optimized for, unless there's like a safety concern or something plays mm. one-to-one. -one. Like it's real time. If a fight takes a minute in game, it's a minute out of game. Kind I've of. seen that Hawkeye episode. Um, <laughs> 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 yes i knew uh, some of those people uh, <laughs> those were some new york larpers i knew yeah. in there um like in minds eye theater especially like i said it, it moved away from it it got closer to tabletop as time went on because a lot mm -hmm. more people wanted it they wanted to be able to take their tabletop characters and larp with them or vice versa but they mm. don't really one-to-one -one translate yeah. at all I okay. actually played a table, a basically tabletop game using the Mind's Eye Theater rules at one yeah. point. I mean, you, you can, like, you absolutely can, but, like, attributes, for example, are so much cheaper in Mind's Eye Theater than they are mm -hmm. on tabletop. And tabletop, you start with far more abilities than in Mind's Eye Theater. And, you know, like, there's, there's fundamental, they look the same, but there's fundamental differences in how they work and how the economy yeah. is. So, yeah, um, I, I do like, though, not having to pick between. The different types of abilities it's like abilities are more for these are the types of challenges you have access to rather than yeah this is how good you are at thing x but it, the retest is important mm. well, yeah is it, it was what you wanted to be good at in terms of like you don't need computers to operate a computer you need computers to be really good with a mm. computer and we tried to point that out like you don't because people would be like do i need to take a level of drive because i have a car it's like no <laughs> no 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 <laughs> drive means you're good at it like this is something that you enjoy and that you're better than average at it and we tried to get that home but sometimes people would kind of miss that and they'd be like well i should have computers because my character knows how to use a computer and it's like no 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 focus <laughs> focus Especially today, that would just be. Just, well, yeah. well, I mean, we're still in like dial-up modem territory in '97, so yeah. like, but yeah, it's like I remember Mage First Edition. You know, when wireless, when Wi-Fi was a rote, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a magic spell to have Wi-Fi. With backgrounds, I, I was thinking. I don't know what Josh you're particularly pointing to, uh, but the ones that I was really thinking about. Companion must just be the most fun, like to just bring a stuffed animal or something and have it be your chimerical companion. Um, <laughs> yeah. We have had so many great companion like portrayals in, in the games that I've been in. Yeah. It's it's almost always worth its weight in gold. Excellent. Um, so. Yeah. Sometimes it's fun when there's somebody who's like dipping their toes in and in a vampire LARP, they might be like, oh, I'll play somebody's ghoul. Playing someone's chimerical companion is really <laughs> fun too. Yes, we had we had an uh, in the first in the game that this was based on my high school game. My girlfriend's younger sister, who was like 11 at the time, came initially as a chimera because she just wanted to see what her big mm -hmm. sister was doing. And we're like and then later she played a childing. But like she literally played a chimerical companion for one of the players yep. for like two sessions and had a ball like she had so much fun. One of the background things that I really liked, actually, though, was the influence charts, because 
it seemed to me like a very sort of elegant way to collapse things like allies, contacts, Mm -hmm. ties. I I feel like throughout the World of Darkness games across editions, there have been attempts to make these sets of merits and flaws, different kinds of background dots. And the way it's done here where you can take the background, I guess you, you could take it multiple times, right? Yes. Okay. And then yeah, you could take street influence two and then high society influence one. Yeah. 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 yeah so I, I think it's a very, um, it's an interesting way to kind of handle all of that in one go. One of the things that was, in, cause that's a carryover from like vampire had the same influence mm-hmm. charts and things like that. And we had to doctor them for changeling, but like um, one of the interesting things about it was always like I would ask people how to explain their influence. And a lot of them got some great backstory and character detail trying to figure out like yeah. just justifying, like, why do you have high society influence? <laughs> like, you know, or, and cause they'd be, they'd be like, I took high society three. I'm like, that's cool. How not being combative, but like your character is a red cap in a biker gang. Are you like <laughs> the black sheep of a rich family? Cause that's cool. If that's the case. Awesome. Yeah. You know, like, and so people would really get into how they thought about it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and this this also ties into something that comes up a lot, especially in ongoing LARPs, where, I mean, again, it depends on the LARP, how many people, that kind of thing. But it, it's a lot more tolerant and accepting of some player character versus player character stuff happening. Yeah. And a lot of this influence stuff is, is downtime system, essentially, between games is where it usually plays out yeah. for the most part. Which is, again, not really a thing that happens as much in tabletop. So, and influence, uh, influence was as important as this as the game staff let it be. Also, because influence mm-hmm. in some games that I played was basically a mini game that was played inside the game. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, in yeah. other games, it was yeah. almost entirely ignored. Vampire, at one point after this book came out, had a supplement that just had like all this extended influence rules that took it really far. Yes. The yeah. See, that's the kind of thing I adore. So I would be totally into that. Yeah, it just started to get a bit much. And it was one of those things where like, if you had to have pretty much everyone in the game commit to it or not. Hmm. Because if only some people did, they either wound up feeling it was useless or they became super OP because of mm-hmm. their influence. So it was kind of a thing where pretty much everyone had to kind of get on board with it. Um, or it wasn't really yeah I, me and like other games i've been like, there was a lot of tweaking to try to be like okay how can we have this be a thing but also be a thing that you have to do things in session to make them yeah. meaningful and that was always a tricky thing yeah so then we get some information about negative traits and how one <laughs> can take those and so i had to kind of get my head around the fact that this is not the same as merits and flaws but once i figured that out i was like oh okay yeah that's cool like of course you can be I don't know, combative, and then that would give you a bonus other trait. Mm-hmm. So that's, I like that. As a yeah, the negative traits, as we said, were almost, even though a lot of kiths got a negative trait by default, mm-hmm. m- many people didn't call them. They would forget that they had them. Like, yeah. Every every issue is impatient, but I was almost never called on any of the issue I knew, for example. Yeah, like in LARP, maybe the percentages is, might be higher, might be the same. It's like, in terms of a tabletop game, you know, some players just don't really remember the rules of the book and yet reminding, but when you're playing in a LARP, there's less people reminding you because everyone's just role-playing and they're not all staying together. Right. So (laughs) there's a lot of people who just probably didn't know negative. Like there's a lot of times they're like, Oh, I do like somebody would call it a negative trait. And then someone else would be like, what? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That was the most common response when someone called a negative trait was the other person would go, what does that mean? (laughs) What, what, what does that do? And like, it's one of the reasons, like I said, I don't generally try to, pr- I like, I, I try to close any really awful loopholes if I find them. But like at the end of the day, LARP is a trust exercise because there isn't a GM around all the time. You have to trust the players are going to play in the spirit of the game and be, you know, kind to each other and, and so forth. Like, cause you won't, a lot of things occur outside of the attention of, of staff. So you yeah. just kind of have to roll with it. Yeah. You'd have to do a lot more than that 10 to 1 to... (laughs) And then that's the point, right? It's like... Yeah. hmm. So then the merits and flaws, which I I do appreciate how there are ones that kind of mimic the birthrights and frailties of some of the kiths. That was always something which I found interesting in games like Vampire, where there would be Bruja can't take this flaw, Venture can't take this flaw. 
and it was mimicking yeah. their weaknesses, but then Changeling didn't really seem to have that quite as strongly. Well, mm-hmm. and one of the things that, that influenced me about that was I, I thought like so many Changelings are, are fairy tales and legends and myths and things and fairy tale lines get blurry a mm-hmm. lot of the time. So if you have a she, but you want to play like a banshee and you want to do something like horrific, like being able to devour someone alive, you take the red cap thing where you can eat anything. And like, you're a she from this particular kind of legend, like the Kith merits and flaws that let you simulate other birthrights were designed to show that stories, some stories are a little different. Mm -hmm. So like, that's what I had in mind. But then a lot of the tabletop players got annoyed when they found out those weren't in tabletop. Yeah. They're like, wait, that's amazing. And that's when I got in trouble, but (laughs) for doing that. And like the one one of the other weird ones, like the bad moon flaw where you turn on Sealy in Moonlight mm-hmm. was literally just a house rule for our game because our game was set in New Orleans and I just decided that was a thing that happened in New Orleans and no one knew why. And then we put it in as like a, a flaw and I've known so many people who took it years later and it just always makes me smile because it was just like a little setting quirk for our own personal game that we put into the rules and now people take it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I personally really liked the Fey songs one. I thought that was wonderful. Oh, I love Fey songs. Yeah. So, and the um, immortal passion, which makes a lot more sense to me than just true love. It's like, well, what about the other true passions? I want true yeah. wrath. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was one of the ones that one of my players came up with in like the playtest that we were playing. Is like everyone basically was like, this guy is the embodiment of fury because he was just this concentrate he was a he was a gwydian knight and he was the embodiment of like righteous fury and so we eventually made the merit for him to mm-hmm. have that quality so that was kind of dedicated to him there nice. um, so you you kind of alluded to this before but at the or near the end of the chapter we have the experience chart and i'm curious how that usually shakes out compared with a tabletop game because obviously the costs <laughs> are rather different and the economy of experience expenditure wow that's a difficult phrase to say the economy of experience (laughs) expenditure is quite different yeah the tricky part with the xp chart was that power creep is is a thing in larp because of how long a lot of larps are Mm -hmm. and a lot of times what people would do is immediately buy up their traits because it's cheap and they would max out the their maximum number of traits per category because it made it more likely that you would win on a tie Mm -hmm. and it was easy to do. And it was the number one move for a lot of players out of the gate was to max at least one of their trait categories. If they were social character, Mm -hmm. max your social traits Mm -hmm. and so forth. Like they didn't want me to have banality on the chart. And I was like, no, trust me. Some people will do it. Mm -hmm. Like go, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like it's like shadow dice and Wraith go for it. It, What what could possibly go wrong? Uh Oh, Minds of Theater was generally supposed to to be low XP, long term development, but people often, if especially if they hadn't run Minds of Theater before, would award more XP than they should. Mm. Uh, which is why in later books we actually gave more advice on how much XP should be given. And there's a big difference. Like if you're the in college, just out of college, people running a weekly game, yeah, you're gonna run into that problem way faster than the people with a big job doing a, a more involved life doing once a month because that's plenty thank you yeah <laughs> that's fortunately changeling did benefit from the fact that you have a lot of different things you can buy mm. which did help spread mm-hmm. the economy out a little more in terms of you had to buy realms and arts and you know traits and and you're actually paying xp on backgrounds yes the sanctity of backgrounds idea was something that wouldn't come along for a long time so like you know, I had had people, you know, I've been in games where people killed my five point ally and I'm like, well, that was fun. <laughs> I spent a bunch of XP on that, but he's dead now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So Ooh. brief functional question, because I, I do see that buying off negative traits is one of the options for experience. When you're doing a challenge and you have a tie, how do negative traits work into the equation do they subtract they that probably would have been a great idea but it's not how it worked now they think about that would be a very good idea but um you called them to make your opponent bid extra Ah, so instead of losing one trait if i called a negative trait on you and you had let's say you had gullible 
uh, you had one gullible trait. And I called, aren't you a bit gullible for that? You now had to put up a second trait. And if you lost the challenge, you lost the two traits you bit instead of just one. Okay. It did, it did get confusing when the negative traits were in a different, and this is not from just like, this was the, the era of my day theater had it where it's like, uh, violent is a mental trait and it's yeah. like oh, yeah like you'd want to use that in a social and it's like yeah mm. yeah and and we would allow people to call them when they were appropriate across category yeah. but that was a house rule it wasn't a it wasn't an official so yeah it's definitely the kind of thing where i feel like as as with many games i'm sure um i would probably grasp it a lot more intuitively just watching an hour of people doing this yeah because yeah. the whole the calling and the bidding is, is... You, you might get a group of people who hadn't weren't really experienced with mind's eye theater and they're just sort of fumbling around with their challenges and then like yeah. they'd see like two other people who like had a lot of experience and then they're like oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i just know how to roll dice the idea with the adjectives was also to try and make it as least disruptive as possible mm-hmm. by saying things like, you know, I'm clever enough to get past you. I'm too observant for that to work. We still sound at least vaguely like we're in character. Yep. Even if technically we're declaring actions it, as opposed to just being like physical challenge. I'm using stealth to get past you. You know, like that mm. was the goal was to try and work it into role play or at least minimally disrupt the role playing atmosphere. I've seen it work well. I've seen it not work. Well. And there was always the people trying to use their their negative traits for. The, it's like I'm repugnant enough that you'll leave me alone. Yeah, we, I had people who were like, "Can I call a negative trait as a defense?" <laughs> I'd be like, "Uh, I mean, you're admitting you have it, so I guess if you want to, you know, like." Yeah. <laughs> to that end, I understand negative traits in particular being kind of a closed set because, it, yeah, if you call them out, you want to be. You want to know what the options are, mm-hmm. but is yeah. it more accepted to make your own for the the positive traits? Is that allowed? Not not generally because they want we wanted to be able to have a resource where everyone had a that was going off the same list. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I do know, and also sometimes people would try and cheese that a little bit and try and come up with a trait that's almost always appropriate, like resourceful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, or, well, actually, resource was on there. But, uh, <laughs> I did see occasional house rules where they'd be like, uh, we like the trait system from this other game, other Minds A Theater game of this other edition. Yeah. Bring in these traits or something. But Yeah, I, I did see there were times where people would ask if they could come up with a trait because positive traits, it didn't matter as much as long as it wasn't something that was overly useful for anything. Yeah. I didn't mind mm-hmm. it. Uh, but like, yeah, the negative traits have to be set list because otherwise you'll never guess them. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, the penalty is if you guessed a negative trait and they didn't have it, then you had to put up another trait. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it could get, you know, pretty. Uh, I did see Kith negative traits get called out more. Than yes. That. Because everybody knew that Boggins were gullible, for example, or red caps. I mean, that you've like two uh, negative traits by default. Yeah. There was a uh, common theme of she using it against Slua. Uh, yep <laughs> just uh, like in the tabletop game yeah. yeah and there was a lot of criticism over the use of like having permanent negative traits that kids can't buy off and i'm like look fairy tale characters usually have flaws like they're yeah. exploitable like there's always you you can trick rumple stiltskin if you know the trick so that's kind of what we were going for there i guess i'm curious just in connection to that comment about the economy because it is comparatively cheap to buy new new traits i mean certainly compared with raising attribute dots it's cheap and it makes sense Mm -hmm. because those are the currency by which you're interacting and challenging and whatever but i i can imagine to your point about people maxing out categories like at some point you just have every trait on this list (laughs) or most of them or you could double up and stuff yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Because like you might want to have agile times three because mm. you want to use agility a lot. That's so, true. Yeah. I don't know if this book had it, but I know some. I remember from some Mind's Eye Theater book, you could double up your negative, but like you really don't want people to guess it for some. Like I think you are you so gullible, yeah. so repugnant. It's yeah. like you, if you have gullible times three, you have to like pony up three traits of somebody. Yeah. Oh. If someone yeah. called gullible, you you had to pony up three extra traits. So like multiple copies of a negative trait were dangerous yeah. um, if someone learned that you had it like and again with the kiths a lot of people would know that you off most of the kiths had one so mm-hmm. but like i knew someone who had 14 physical traits and all of them were dexterous and i'm like <laughs> what 
why do you have this? <laughs> like, uh, okay. Well, it like, would always it would always be interesting if like there's a fight, like some like let's suppose there was a there was a physical a game where some physical stuff had happened, right? And somebody had been in a lot of scraps and they ran out of like applicable physical traits yeah <laughs> like they still have some but they're just like this makes no sense here i can't just do it i had someone who's like i stalwartly punch you in the face i'm like that's not a thing you can't do that <laughs> like yeah. that's that's not a thing which is why i mean each trait has a description of when it's generally useful so that people wouldn't argue there, too much there would be some uh, somebody trying to twist <laughs> things but yeah because the dexterous guy was like it's always applicable because i'd be like i try and hit you he's like i dexterously take the shot i'm like what like uh all right i dexterously climb the wall yeah so we should get started on chapter three okay. changeling yeah. magic i i want to ask when you were putting this together because something we've noticed going through these books is that the timelines of things the timelines of when things were written when things were published all of that's kind of up in the air. Um, how much of an influence was the first edition system on this, and how much was the second edition? A lot of it was was first edition because bunks got a lot more fluid. And second edition, I'm trying to remember was when was second edition released? Ninety seven. Ninety seven. Yeah. This. So yeah. it had just come out, and I think a lot of it was written before I'd had a chance to incorporate it. Mm -hmm. And also, as you can see, like I said before, I was trying to cram in everything I could from every mm -hmm. supplement book. Yeah, so like yeah, Pyretics exactly. is in here and other things, you know, like some of the ones from Player's Guide or other like source books. You know, I shoved in the Clerican and the Selkies and but the bunk system, it wasn't like the card based system exactly, although some players actually played it that way where they'd put their bunks on little like index cards yeah. and have someone pick them. That was um, basically what I was thinking. Like, it would be very easy to just kind of use cantrip yeah. cards in order to do this. And yeah. and some some games I knew did that, and that worked. The bunking system that my friend Steve came up with, which is in the the Shining Host Players Guide, though, was way better, um, <laughs> way more fun. Mm. Um, Suspense. Yeah, <laughs> all, all the all the games I ran or played in of Changeling, we always just had it more like in second edition or vaguely more like c20 weirdly but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> despite it being well before c20 but well, like, i remember it's like sometimes people would do like these super elaborate like scene setting planned out weeks in advance bunks for like soothsay or something and it would just be yeah. like well and like my my friend steve who ran the game winner's edge which was a long-running changeling game i think it's still running actually if i, if I recall every once in a while uh, it was a very long-running changeling larp his system was so much I'm, I'm i'm jumping ahead to the player's guide here i guess but like it was much more larp friendly because he had very simple rules like you got one bunk point one bunk trait if you acted out your bunk within the rules of safety um you had you got one bunk trait if you used a prop of some kind or had some other sort of physical uh, interaction you got one point if it took longer than a minute another point if it took longer than five minutes and another point if it took more than an hour. And there were a couple other things. So it was very easy to tally up your points. And you added a lot to the role-playing atmosphere while you did it. It was an incredibly elegant way of doing bunks in live action. And mm. so that's why I asked him. He's credited in the front of the Changeling Player's Guide as the creator of the system for like the alternate bunk system um, in the Player's Guide. Because I was like, this is so much better than writing mm. them down in advance. And like... I mean, that has a certain charm to it, but like it also can get repetitive. So, and it relies on the storyteller to personally give everyone's bunks a rating. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, I don't think I'd read through this properly before. And I'm like, I, yeah. you get 30 people playing in the game, like organizing that, and people want to yeah. do new bunks every <laughs> session. And then... yeah, that was the, that was the problem. It's like, it seems okay until you actually try to put rubber to road. And that's, one of the things when Shining Host came out, I was on the Mind's Eye for the old White Wolf forums all the time. And Aww. I was the self appointed guardian of Changeling LARP on the White Wolf Mind's Eye forum <laughs> for a long time. I was so protective of Changeling LARP because, I mean, it was my first book that I ever, like, my first real serious role playing job. And I love Changeling. I still love it with all my heart. And, like, 
and it got dumped on by so many other people in the mind's eye community because they were like it's mm-hmm. silly it's stupid i'm like changeling is the most tragic game out there other than wraith yeah, yeah. yeah. And, or, or it can be like that, the thing is like changeling is so flexible we can you can have a changeling game that's completely over the top silly and then the next game can be game of thrones cutthroat politics and then the next game can be a wild party and all of it fits in changeling none of the other white wolf games really have that kind of tonal flexibility exactly not not by design anyway i'll put it that way um, and it's also kind of like the accusation of it being silly the response i want to give is so also that we're, playing, yeah. like, we're walking around <laughs> saying these weird adjectives and then playing rock paper scissors exactly. with people yeah. dressed up in costume there's nothing not silly about this right yeah. whether you're dressed as a vampire or not like yeah my yeah. my friend andy always used to say elves in the woods throwing fireballs you know like it's all st- it's all silly just get over it like yeah. right we would poach players from other genres. Like if we were playing a mixed world of darkness LARP, we often had people leave the vampire werewolf part and come <laughs> join us. Cause we were having the most fun as yeah. changelings. So like we were visibly enjoying ourselves a lot of the time. <laughs> so to the point about fireballs, just yeah. briefly looking through the arts, uh, it does seem like for the most part, there are a few levels that seem to have been removed, I guess, for various reasons, but otherwise everything pretty much tracks with what's in the tabletop there's one of them that's got six i think but yes there is one that was, that, has... that was because all the other the vampire mind the theater and stuff had done that primal too, right? primal has six because it has yeah. elder form and um and holly, well, holly strike. strike and heather balm separated back out yeah yes mm-hmm. and then there were a couple that only had one at each level like pyretics which mm-hmm. People got weird about that too, which I understand, but I was like, these are lesser arts. And also some of them, I was like, some of these are just not easily simulated in live action, even in, you know, a game with a lot of imagination and so forth. Like, so that's why some, some arts got changed a bit because I'm like, this doesn't work well in LARP. The example I like to give is like, there's a power when I was writing Requiem for, for, um, for like second edition Mind's Eye Theater for the new world of darkness. There's a power in Obfuscate where you appear as who the target thinks they want to see. Oh, uh, yeah. And I'm like, that is impossible in LARP. Like, that's great at a tabletop. That is impossible at a LARP. And, yeah, yeah. And so I changed it to you become a generic person who fits in where where you are. Like, you blend into the background kind of thing. And people got really mad because, like, it's not the tabletop. I'm like, but the tabletop power does not work here. You have to yeah. go with what LARP is good at like it's almost uh, like trying to make a video game and going oh let's have the exact same mechanics between video game and a tabletop game you can't yeah do that yeah. and it's one of the things i see happen at a lot of boffer games is a lot of boffer games still have things like this spell has a 30 foot range do you really want to try and measure 30 feet in the middle of a ongoing <laughs> live battle because i don't <laughs> so um this spell know. is a range of how far you can throw a beanbag packet full of burn yeah. seed so, or either that, or you have to constantly call time out so that someone can get out their measuring tape and yeah. that just ruins everything, you know, like, yeah. but they're so obsessed with like, it, it's like D and D. Yeah. But D and D you play at a table, man. Like we're in the, we're running around in real time. That's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Oh. I did appreciate how much that does come through here though. Like, I think it was, it might've been like elder form or something. There were certain arts where, there was a lot of attention given to how can you adequately run this in a LARP, which is something you don't have to really think about at a table. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. and like, you know, trying to include things like you need hand gestures for this or a description Mm -hmm. card or, you know, things of that nature, like trying to help people figure out how to play it, like how to depict it because changeling magic is weird. And Mm -hmm. a lot of the other thing that was funny thing is like a lot of the vampire players, especially sometimes the werewolves too, but would be like changelings are silly and stupid and also completely overpowered. I'm like, well, (laughs) um, yeah. And and this was the era we had second edition tabletop and this coming out and like crossover second edition. (laughs) Oh, somebody's got a high banality. You're rolling difficulty 13. Good luck. Yeah. But this is like, no, you're actually kind of, it's more like C20 power level. So. Yeah, because my thought was always whoever's game it primarily is should be the coolest. Yeah. If you're a vampire in a changeling game, congrats. You're not going to be the coolest person in the room. Yeah. You get to add your banality. Good luck. 
That's your yeah. <laughs> like, and if you do that, it'll work, and then we will all hate you and avoid yeah. you. But you know, if you're in a vampire game and you're playing a werewolf, you're gonna not be as cool as the vampires. You're not supposed to mm-hmm. be. But yeah, right. and if you're playing the game to be cool, then that's probably not <laughs> the best reason to be playing it. That that was the other thing. Like changeling magic, trying to figure out how to do the realms in in that chapter. Like we had to change distances for scene because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. magic that infects an entire room in tabletop is eh, but in a lot of LARPs, most of the game takes place in one room. You know, if you're in somebody's house and you're playing in their living room, most Mm -hmm. of the players are in one room. So suddenly scene affects the entire game. And if it's not, it's probably in one building or that area. And then you're like, yeah. So, so like people are like, Whoa, scene got a lot less powerful. I'm like, no, it got as powerful as it needs to be for LARP because yeah like you need to adjust these things for live action reality yeah and having the things the art notes as well kind of helps with that so like wayfair for example it's like if if you're teleporting you need to do a timeout and like go to where you're going because (laughs) unless you've developed some teleportation capability in the real world that the rest of us don't have (laughs) i'm trying to remember how it worked by the book for actually casting an art on a willing person including yourself um Usually you just had to do the bunk and spend any necessary yeah. glamour if they were willing. Okay, that's, that's right. Yeah, it's been a yeah. while. Yeah, but yeah, that's why me and a lot of other people were like, I'm going to try to stick to art on myself or because <laughs> it's just so much easier. <laughs> well, yeah, and because uh, like uh, the realms were also, you know, people always really hated the fact that like you needed actor four to do people that you knew kind of thing mm. like or to do strangers sorry other mm-hmm. way around and i was like changelings aren't necessarily supposed to be offensive machines you know mm-hmm. like all of that is geared towards this white room balance thing of like yeah. all the games must be perfectly balanced to each other and like that has never been true and will never be yeah. true i mean uh, and then you just use pyretics to make your fists on fire and then punch the vampire <laughs> yeah you call upon the weird and you make it real and then you punch the surprised vampire to death one of the first villains was a Ravnos because sh- chemistry used to create chimerical objects. Yeah. So Ravnos could just mess with changelings all day long. So he was our like arc mm-hmm. villain for one of our first arcs and and one of my changeling larps was a Ra- elder Ravnos who would just ruin their world. For actor 4, I mean, that's why you never give the fae your name. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> I never thought of that. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's part of why you don't do that. Like the same thing with time, you know, scene and time both had to be adjusted for LARP and mm-hmm. like, cause LARP is usually played in something close to real yeah. time. So time's um, the one I don't think it ever, it's like, there's three editions that use it and including this. And I still, it's always weird. Yeah. It's like like every scene. 20, it's so broken and powerful. And then <laughs> the other two, it's not powerful enough. And I'm, yeah. I think every game I've ever been in where someone had time, it has been in one way or another house ruled. Like, yeah, in some fashion. Yeah. So, well, yeah. But I love the fact that like changeling players, bec- and again, in the spirit of the game, are mixing arts and realms became an art in itself. Mm-hmm. They come up with clever applications of things. I-, I love that about it. But that was what a lot of the other games complained about: is that like, well, if they have this realm, they can just affect me. Yeah. So, I mean, you're a vampire. Your dominate affects anyone you can make eye contact with. Shut up. Um, like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And like, I I just, I always loved when players would come up with really cool combinations of arts and realms, Mm -hmm. you know, and come up with stuff that you never thought they'd come up with. Yeah. Again, like I was, I was furiously cobbling together as many things as I can. Like, I love naming magic Mm -hmm. because it's so very fey. I've always loved naming, Mm -hmm. but naming is arguably the most broken of arts. I mean, I don't think it's any more broke it here than in the tabletop. So that's, that's true. Or less broken either. It's, it's very similar. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the the thing was, like, I was always more concerned with changeling arts and realms with making them fun and dramatic and cool than trying to balance them. Mm-hmm. So, like... Yeah, and I mean, yeah, as long as naming <clears throat> doesn't make someone into an, an a PC into an NPC. I guess vice versa. No, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to all the stuff to keep track of, so you were talking about the character sheets earlier, I guess this actually, this kind of gets us into the beginning of Chapter 4, where we're talking about systems and rules. How often does it come up in a game that people are actually like whipping out their character sheet and looking at things and crossing things off and consulting? Like, what percentage of a LARP is that? Slash, do you think that should be? 
I mean, it depends on the LARP and the culture of the players and whatnot. And different players will have different amounts. But people typically, in my experience, pull out their sheet after sort of an interaction scene. You know, like, mm. unless there's, like, something heavy going on with, like, a lot of arts and combat. And... Yeah, it's usually in the natural beat after an interaction. People will take their sheets out and quietly, you know, do whatever adjustments they need. Um mm-hmm. But I had many nights where I never took my sheet out. But yeah, I had a good, I had a good memory for my traits. So yeah, like, that's mm, that's what I usually um, did too. Like I didn't like if you have the little ticket things, maybe. But yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Now that I think about it, the more experienced players often only pull out their sheet when like a narrator asks to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and and I imagine with something like the glamour, I mean, the tickets, I think, is a very elegant solution because otherwise, yeah. every time you spend it, you'd have to be yeah. crossing it off. Also, giving people a tangible thing helps make their powers feel more consequential mm-hmm. sometimes, too. Or, like, mm. I also, when I was running Vampire, I would do that for gaining blood. Yep. And yeah. hand, having a like having the victim hand you several tickets, meaning that you drained this much blood from them or whatever, yeah. helped sell it because it was tangible. It was something they could put their hands on. There's a common thing among Tremere with a certain ritual or i can't remember what their word for their things is where you end up with like little like red gummies <laughs> oh yeah i know exactly the yeah. ritual you mean because it's in the tabletop as well yeah we wear the tremere with the blue ribbon around their neck too yeah oh, yeah they didn't win the prize at the fair let's just leave it at that oh that reminds me early on we talk about enchanted people would be like with a green <laughs> where did that green come from oh the green armband it makes total sense to be green but green why button. does it make sense to be green it just it just seemed like the changeling color. I don't know. It just yeah. seemed like fey and green. We thought about doing like rainbow, but like that's that could be complicated, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, but something finding something green was just easy. Yeah. Isn't that that is like something from folklore though, isn't it? When you think of like the green knight and everything. Yeah, like the sash and you know with the green knight and like. But yeah, it just seemed it just seemed to be a color that went with the fey. We also we eventually got to the point where we would use face paint that we would do for each kith so that people could easily oh, identify them mm. like, sort of a minimum costume like if you wanted to do more than that we wouldn't insist on it but like we draw little blue horns on someone's forehead mm. so that oh hey troll or like little brown horns satyr or you know like um we would do little bits of makeup so that people could identify kith at a glance but that was that came later I tried to put that in the book and they were like, uh, we don't want to enforce mm-hmm. uh, like a dress code. I'm like, it was just a suggestion. Like uh, this would be my optional suggestion. I played in a boffer or had something similar for the non-human, like the elves oh, yeah. all had dead pointy yeah. ears and every dwarf had to have a beard and yeah. halflings had hairy palms, no, hairy back of the hands. Uh, but, oh dear yeah there, a lot of a lot of buffer games do that especially elf ears or you know or things like that like and then somebody has a big a real big full beard and you're like are you a dwarf <laughs> yeah that was that was the thing with like our changeling thing what we would do is we'd do that makeup at cons because a lot of people can't bring elaborate makeup to yep. a convention game or maybe they didn't realize they were going to larp until they decided that's how they wanted to spend saturday mm-hmm. night <laughs> so we'd help them get made up because the more made up they are the more they get into the larp putting on face paint and stuff, you know, or putting on makeup helps people just feel like yeah. they're in it. You know? you know, the red caps get like the rivets in their foreheads. Cause you want to be authentic. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Or we'd bring like a, a couple extra red bandanas, you know, or, or like, you know, so they could do a do rag or. Yeah. <laughs> you should probably just say for any listeners who haven't LARPed that the default method of resolving tests, because this is in this chapter yeah. is to do rock, paper, scissors, which I know we've kind of mentioned, but just to say it flat out. Yeah, and fair escape means it's there's certain rules yeah. for when you can just say I've just left the scene instead of getting like super elaborate. How fast are you running or some? And, and it also like was that. a safety thing so that people didn't feel like they had to bolt for the door in real mm-hmm. life, you know, like to to leave a scene or mm-hmm. to escape. Like, I do have a question <laughs> for static challenges, which are the ones against the narrator, where you're not actually up against another person you're just trying to like pick a lock or whatever so it mentions that the narrator chooses a difficulty appropriate to the task and i'm curious how that works uh you're going to keep on being curious because i don't think this book had a a list of range for numbers if i remember yeah Uh, i think 
I meant to, and I think I never got around to putting in like, uh, you know, easy difficulty is three, and you know, like, yeah, uh, you know, average difficulty is five, difficult, you know, hard is seven, you know, or in, you know, impossible is fourteen, or like, I meant to, but I don't think we got it in this book. So yeah, I I would go through and I'd be like, okay, somebody had three. What would it be if somebody had like what was the max you can get up to for one category? Uh, depended on your seeming. Yeah, but like without without bonuses, like like a mortal level max. Oh, the mortal level max was ten, if I remember. Yeah, right. like ten was the max. Mm-hmm. But even if it's like fifteen and somebody has ten, you still have a one in three chance. So it's kind of yeah, you know, it's like twenty to thirty. It's like Herculean. Would not expect people to do it. Kind of. It's interesting how you are kind of like bidding your own strengths. I mean, you're you're. Yeah. I was going to say something about, I can't believe there's only four health levels, but then the more I thought about it, the more I was like, but you also kind of have like social health levels and mental health mm-hmm. levels because you're bidding traits. Yeah, they did. That's another thing they did change in the revised era of books, which Changely didn't get just like in tabletop. No, no. Um, I think they did bring it to seven. Didn't they? Yeah. For Melissa and it revised. And we also tried, like, the other thing with the Shining Host Player's Guide was it tried to kind of update Changeling to be more with the revised Mind's Eye rules. Like, mm-hmm. I worked on Laws of the Night revised as well. And, like, and so after that, I'm like, okay, the next time I do a Changeling book, I'm going to make it more like what, you know, what's in here, what's in mm-hmm. here, because it was very first edition. I think we talked about this earlier. The section on combat, I just have, like, underlined in my notes, running combat must be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> It can be. With group challenges, somebody has to be, it could be a narrator, it could be a player, somebody has to be the person that's tested against if there's a whole bunch of people. You can get in these weird situations where it's like multiple people all in the same thing, and you do have to say somebody is the one that you'll base winning, losing, or tying off of. Yeah. <laughs> and the the other problem with Minds Eye Theater Combat was, while well, it's supposed to be quick, it often wound up, we called it the popcorn ball because people would wander into yeah. a room and be like, wait, what's going on? Is there combat? I'm joining in. You know, like what, yeah. what we actually did was we'd have like, okay, if there was a, not two people fighting, but like a group combat, what I've yeah. seen work well is you have like one narrator storyteller dealing with the combat. Another one's going and just blocking the room. And it's like, no, you can't come in. Nope, you can't get yeah, involved we, until this fought, combat's resolved. Or sometimes we we would yeah we would have a doorman like that, or we or we would yeah. say you can join in two rounds because if your character heard yeah. the noise, you could eventually join the fight. Yeah, that but, type of thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah and somebody to to just play that aside so like nobody has to worry about it. And we would usually also be like anyone who doesn't want to fight clear out and you can go to the next room to role continue role playing. Like if you yeah. do not want to be caught up in this combat. Your characters can declare fair escape and leave. If nobody's targeting you, you can leave and continue role playing, you know, because the fight is only supposed to take a few seconds in game, but it will take several minutes. That's one of the reasons why it's important for when you're choosing your space. Yeah. I mean, if it's a really small and you're basically just tabletop, fine. But like if it's more than that, you want to have two well separated spaces, like indoors, probably different rooms, at least <laughs> for when you're choosing a venue. Mm. By comparison, the glamour systems are very straightforward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say also, you, you had mentioned having players who wanted to play mortals and something I just really wanted to highlight here is uh, the attention to the epiphanies. Something I've probably railed against more times than I care to think about in this podcast is <laughs> I see a trend of players doing, I won't say everything in their power, but a lot of what's in their power to avoid role-playing things like reverie or rapture Mm. or even even ravaging and just treating like gathering glamour as this afterthought it's the same kind of thing i see in vampire Mm -hmm. where people are like i go hunting it's like well but in a larp situation if you do have someone willing to play the mortal i feel like that could be one of the most elegant experiences so i was really happy to see how it was kind of outlined here it's succinct it's straightforward but there's enough here for me to be like wow i could I could build entire mini games around this. Yeah, well, for me, like, and also like, Rhapsody was brand new when I was writing this. Like, mm. the whole Leon and Rhapsody thing was brand new, so I kind of like threw it in there because it was fascinating and terrifying. But like, yeah. that's why my first character was a Leon. Yeah, I, 
I love the Leon and she, I really do. And so like at that point, only they were supposed to be able to do it. So, but in, again, in LARP, I'm like, ah, oh, other people can do it too. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm going to just move away from tabletop and do this. But like, yeah, because when we did that for even in high school, in our high school game, people loved role playing their like reverie and rapture, you know, time and stuff. Like it was really fun, and it's very LARP friendly sort of experience. Mm-hmm. We also used to do the thing that even if if you went hunting in vampire, in our vampire games, you had to do a scene where you describe yeah. who yeah. you attack, and like you couldn't just be like, well, it's downtime, and I come back with more blood points. You know, I go out and, I, wow. you know, I sit on my phone for 15 minutes and I come back and I'm supercharged. You're like, no, we, we're going to make you feel this. You really should. <laughs> this this might be a, a good segue into talking about the storytelling chapter. I did want to bring up one thing, though, on oaths. But just a little thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. The oaths, some of these oaths have a, just like in the table, there's visible physical things for breaking an oath. Yep. If you see a new player character come in who has, like, matching scars on their mm. face... Or hmm. like cross scars, or like one of them, she got like a uh, like colorful bird stuffed bird thing, and just had it like sewn onto the shoulder of her that was yep. sitting there quietly. And it's like go through the true hearts. It's yeah. immediate like story things. People like the players and characters who know what's going on. He's like, oh, there's some interesting things here to find out what's going on with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like backstory really prevalent, but in a subtle way that you can't. I love the oath section because there's so much LARP potential mm-hmm. in it. Yeah, you just hear somebody just start saying this the text of an oath. That's all. Yeah, and like a lot of my players can still do the oath of clasped hands from memory. Yeah, you know, like they they know it because they swore it. You know, and they remember it. Yeah, or somebody shouts out in the middle of like like you're in yeah. a noble freehold. If they start saying where to stand, there will be one. Yeah, like you're like oh yeah, exactly. I, I found, I think every oath that was in any changeling book at the time is in Shining Host because I hunted yeah. them all down yeah. and put everyone I could find in there. Even the Oath of the Undoing, potent. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I wanted to talk about the the politics part, which is why I brought up Chapter 5. Again, in terms of trends among gamers, my sense in general, just from my own anecdotal experience, is that players now seem much more invested in kind of like high fantasy dreaming escapades more than court politics. Well, court politics are mm-hmm. still there, but they're much less inflected with like, yeah, autumn world banal yeah. concerns and more court politics about who's going to go on the great hunt into the dreaming. Like that, that's more of the vibe, but with LARP. Yeah. Again, in terms of things, it seems just so perfectly suited for just having like, court intrigue yeah it trips into the dreaming don't work great in LARP as a it's a downtime thing or it's a little side scene yeah you exactly session yeah. you take a long time and you set up really well with cool lighting and, and yeah sound but and it's not a regular session let's go along the, the the trods no that doesn't yeah and like and changeling can be intensely political that's again it's one of the things like mm-hmm. yeah it doesn't have to be but it absolutely can be like yeah the game the my wife and I are running now the noble houses. Each of the houses has their own like sheet of objectives before they go to each game. They have to gather certain things that like, and they play politics. Like we, we set it up as kind of a mini game within the game, but like, and then some of the commoner organizations do the same thing. Like we have some like commoner revolutionaries who have similar Mm -hmm. things, but like, and having the whole influences thing that's in the mortal world. There's autumn people there. There's banality there. Yeah. It it brings it in a way that it won't be ignored because there's like other players will try to use influences against another changeling they don't like, and suddenly that's bringing in the mortal world in a way that yeah yeah. I think one of the most important sentences in this entire book is on page two hundred one where it says only after you have finished with the mortal aspects of your setting should you want to consider the enchanted half of the equation because I think ninety percent of players go the other way. Yep, that was always my preference. Like. Because I, I, f- I always feel like you can't do the unreal until the real is established. Otherwise, there's no baseline. Mm. If I'm going to imagine the chimerical world, I need it to be a contrast to the regular one. When we did New Orleans, for example, in the in the game that you know this was that play tested this, whether they knew it or not, we had like chimerical New Orleans was almost like Venice, like the like the bayou had encompassed the city, so a lot of streets were flooded and cars became like like pole boats and like buses became paddle boats and stuff like that. But oh, too yeah. real. We had, well, yeah, unfortunately, 
but we sat down and we looked over, you know, I'm not from New Orleans. I've just always been fascinated by it. But like, we tried to like find real world places and we looked stuff up and we, we went through like guidebooks on New Orleans and we found locations we wanted to make magical. And like, oh, in in the dreaming, this is this, you know, like, and do stuff yeah. like that. And like, it helped it really, you know, sink in. And so that's always how I work. Um, Sorry, all the Minds Eye Theater LARPs I've been in are set where the game is and time moves like time. So that yeah. can also bring in a lot of the mortal stuff because for most things you're like, okay, if it's like a horrible tragedy, that's one thing. But like when we were in Toronto, like late 90s, there was this weird thing where they like made all these moose statues everywhere. <gasps> and that's amazing. this turned into chimerical moose everywhere that became a serious problem. And the count running the city had like called a moose hunt and stuff. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Oh. So there's yeah. this this whole advice. There's one little like I have a slight disagreement, and this is a thing you wrote 25 years, 26 years ago, whatever, right? Oh yeah, and go it, for it. Um, for my preferences, it emphasizes a bit too much the storyteller's story. Yeah. I think it is important, especially if you can get a health of a thriving group going mm-hmm. with enough people. You do need. It's not like you can just sit back and let the players do everything, right? But like, it's about yeah. nurturing the player stories i think oh yeah and that that was definitely me as a high school kid writing a game and not having yeah, the yeah. experience i've had since then with collaborative storytelling but you're absolutely no you're absolutely right like most of the time like sometimes my wife and i would sit back and just watch our game run yeah because like the mm. players would take the few story threads that we had and the rest of the night they'd run with them and yeah we'd just be there to adjudicate if they needed us to do rules because the last thing you want to do when the players are all engaged and make sure all the players are engaged right so you got to watch out for the oh, ones yeah. who are disengaged you don't want to have to like oh these five people are running everything the players and everyone else is bored yep. watching that i've either. been in those games and it sucks that sucks yeah. too but like what sucks is in you have like a, a vibrant large larp going and then the person like the storyteller or whatever tries to like no let's bring it back to my plot that's not good. Yeah. And yeah. like jerks on the leash of the game and like pulls everybody back. And like yeah. my, my friend Andy has a great rule for LARPs. He calls it feeding mm-hmm. fish. He's like, uh, sprinkle up. If you want plot threads, sprinkle them like three times. Yeah. Because he's like, if you've ever fed fish in a fish tank, the most aggressive fish run right up. And if you only sprinkle food once, they'll get all the food. And there are players who will hang back. And if the only people who get plot are the people who run forward when plot is first presented, you're going yeah. to have those games where like five people are involved in everything. You can always sprinkle food over some of the other fish. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on the dynamics, but like, it's like, okay, somebody here wants to engage or not having trouble. Well, one of the like person who's chasing plot point things at that other character in a way, right? That all, yeah. yeah. And like, we also would do what we called the, the spoken wheel um, thing where we'd have one character we did this a lot for convention games where we would be playing with people we don't know is we'd plant an npc in, in each player character group to help if they needed motivation or if they needed to engage if they were getting bored or distracted our npc would help kind of nudge them along or come to us and be like hey my group's not doing anything can you throw some plot their way or like get them involved in what's going mm-hmm. on and, and they wouldn't take over they were we picked them because they were players who were good at lifting other people up Yep. And so they wouldn't hog the spotlight, but we had NPCs who would kind of help them stay in, engaged and stay motivated. So, yeah, it's I had I was guilty of that sin, though, when I was younger, where I'd be like, this is the mm-hmm. story outcome I wanted. And I would just try and like bend everything to make it work. And now mm-hmm. <laughs> like I thought, I, thought I'd mention in case someone's inspired, gets a copy of mine. I think the shiny goes goes to run a LARP. It's like and they listen to this. No, uh, a little. Yeah. 17 yeah, year old Pete was 17 years old. Do not listen to everything he says. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good thing to point out, though, for for any game. I mean, because a lot of what you're saying applies to tabletop just as easily. Oh, yeah. So for any yeah. storyteller, yeah. I'm having to learn how to run sto- uh, tabletop. Though I run it too LARP sometimes, and it's like there has to be a little bit more help from the storyteller there. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and for LARP, it. I mean, some of this matters more for LARP. That's I think the difference. Yeah. and. Again, we were talking before about styles of LARP. It also depends on the size of the player base, the size of the location, yeah. like, mm-hmm. you know, how much oversight. Is it ongoing versus one Yeah, off, ongoing yeah. versus one shot, yeah, or limited series. How much money you have. <laughs> also that, yeah. <laughs> like, I remember when I was going, looking on my college tour, 
because I was writing the book around that time. I was touring colleges and I went to Princeton because it's not far from where I grew up. And yeah. it was never going to happen. But my mom's like, well, let's go. Let's go look at it. And I'm wandering around the campus and she's like, what do you think? I'm like, this would make an amazing LARP campus. And she's like, Peter, <laughs> it's also a school. You might have heard of it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but it would be so cool for LARP. And she's like, oh my God, why are we here? <laughs> so that you could have a LARP setting to play. And I, look at, I still look at the world with the eye of a LARP designer a lot. I still mm-hmm. look at areas sure. and I'll see like, ooh, you could have a really fun LARP here. Like, <laughs> you know, like this is But that's the kind of thing which I imagine it makes you a better tabletop storyteller as well and vice versa like i say this as someone who has never done a white wolf larp but i feel better equipped to do one having run tabletop games yeah and i imagine the reverse yeah. is true oh, there's definitely overlap a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah 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 a lot of the advice in here i mean the storytelling chapter i think is probably the strongest part of the book overall the strongest chapter mm-hmm. even even with those 17 year old pete yeah that's the only know. like that that was yeah. i was doing thing it's like that that's <laughs> yeah, the no. one bit and then everything else is great, actually. Yeah, you can t- also tell I was a theater kid because I started talking about lighting and like staging and stuff. A lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's that's the kind of stuff which people don't think about that can kick their game up to yeah. this extra level that really engrosses people. Also, props for having the only gray eye glances reference I think I've ever seen in the wild. So. Oh man, I love that band. <laughs> Yeah, I showed the band the book and they were like, that's wonderful. We have no idea what it is, but thank you for putting us in it. <laughs> I mean, I, I look at it and I see all the awkward phrases and everything and like, you know, the like corny jokes and other s- stuff I thought was great at 17. But I appreciate the company. But I think you were doing a good job fitting the rest of the White Wolf stuff. Yeah, I mean, I wanted I, I really wanted it to be special. I really wanted it to be hmm. You know, I didn't want it to be reskinned vampire, which is uh, honestly, and I, I mean no disrespect to the the werewolf people, but sometimes werewolf felt like a reskin of vampire a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the later werewolf books got better about it, and part of it was early on. Every Minds Eye Theater was supposed to be very simple, so they were very similar because they were trying for mm-hmm. very, very, very simple. But I was like, I really want Changeling to feel different and, and not be the same experience like vampire, but we were wearing Renfair clothes instead of pale makeup. You know. Mm-hmm. Like, or whatever so i tried really hard for that as i was going for it yeah Um, few werewolf larp stuff i'd been in it was very much um uh let's sit around and do story time it was very strong (laughs) werewolf is a is a not a very good fit for a lot of larp yeah much more action combat oriented shape-shifting you know no what i mean is like literally just people talking in character doing stories (laughs) it was so like what I created a, a and ran a two shot boffer werewolf game. Yep. And that was a hell of a good time because we're like, werewolf is meant for fighting. So let's play a LARP style that is designed for fighting. And we had costume changes to signify shape shifting. And like, mm-hmm. you know, we taught players a series of howls so that they could signal danger or triumph or oh, other things. And like, did you, that reminds me of a game we used to play in like school trips and stuff called survival. We were all like pretending to be different animals hunting each other. Anyway. <laughs> cool. I was, like I said at the very beginning, I'm like, I got really possessive of Changeling LARP. I got very protective of it. So like literally every rule in any live action rule book about Changeling is, was written by me. Mm. Like I wrote the Dante section of laws of the hunt. I wrote the Changeling section of time of judgment or laws of judgment. Like I was kind of a jerk about it at one point. <laughs> like, like, because I wanted Changeling also to be consistent because I saw that some Mind's Eye Theater books were really inconsistent based on who wrote them. Mm-hmm. And like infamous Libre de Ghouls was written in a very different style than the rest of Vampire. Mm-hmm. It was like, mm-hmm. I don't know how this works. So like I wanted Changeling to be consistent throughout. Yep. And also nobody else wanted to write Changeling at the time. So I was like, they just kept coming back to me for it. So like, yeah, I, I wanted to just try and make it like a coherent, game experience it seems Um, to have turned out pretty well (laughs) yeah so i mean we definitely want to look at the player's guide in the future i i have this idea at some point being like how to larp changeling in 2023 or 2024 or whatever year yeah yeah. i have a big old note in my notes that that's basically that but that's because there's a bunch of questions like how do you take into account c20 how do you deal with I mean, right. there's even little things like how much money things cost here that are not 
Or just the fact that nowadays, frankly, at least in this country, like having a large group of people acting weird in public is really dangerous yeah. sometimes. Mm. I mean, it always you was, know. but yeah. Yeah, but especially. Yeah. There, there was a, some, of, some of my friends had a story where campus police, they were LARPing at their college campus, were called because someone ran out of a room yelling, he's got C4, he's going to blow us all up. Yeah, yeah. Like, great. So LARP has become a lot more about safety and consent, which is great as a culture, like, and including safety of players and like not freaking out people who aren't involved. Like I have very little tolerance for what, what people like to call freaking the mundanes Yeah, where you go and deliberately try and weird normal people out. I'm like, that's, they didn't ask for that. You know, like it's one thing if people hassle you and you're still in costume and you didn't try to start anything, but like, Mm -hmm. and like, you know, then the weapon rule also, again, if we're playing in a private space, especially like inside someone's home, I don't usually care. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll check because like one of my players had a thing about knives because they've been attacked by someone with a knife before. So I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, and we're safe. also talking about like yeah. plastic swords versus yeah. Or, yeah, or like we'll bring our like boffer swords, you know, yeah. for changeling because you know changeling uses a lot of fantasy medieval weapons. So yeah, you know, we'll bring our boffer blades or whatever. And like, yeah, like storytelling chapters have always been my favorite thing to write. So. Mm-hmm it's kind of what I do now for Onyx path is they'll hire me for a book. And I'm like, I'm writing the storytelling chapter, aren't I? And they're like, yep. I'm like, cool. Okay. <laughs> this is what I like to do. Uh, it's the issue in me. Um, and considering that this came out before the storytellers guide for changeling, I mean, this was probably the best advice. <laughs> yep. And I don't know how much of it got carried over into that. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, we were feeding a lot off of each other back back in that day with mm. white wolf and like i was a freelancer obviously i wasn't at the office in atlanta or in stone mountain but like they were really good about putting people in touch with each other so you know it was still a lot more primitive we couldn't have anything like slack or anything mm-hmm. that we could use but like right um, they would try and coordinate things as best we could so do we have any questions we still need to ask or are those interspersed I think the only question uh, Charles Siegel asks, why did Changeling's book get a cool name like The Shining Host when all the others are Laws of the Night, Laws of the Wild, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, except for Wraith, which just got Oblivion? It was just before Laws of the Night Revised made that an ironclad rule. Mm. Um, they thought this would sound really cool and be very Changeling. Yeah. And then by the time the Player's Guide came out, they didn't want to give the Player's Guide a different name. Mm-hmm. So right. it stayed with it, but it, it does lead to confusion when talking about nobles, the shining host. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. Like I will say the title is not my, my choice. That was yeah. not my, my prerogative, but, ah. uh, but they, yeah, that was just, it just happened to be before that became like our default naming convention. Yeah. Um, so it'd be laws of the dreaming would have been the other. <laughs> it, yeah. And actually we talked about doing a laws of the dreaming at one point and kind of combining the two books. Mm-hmm. But it never it never got off the ground. So someone on the Discord pointed out that Laws of the Dreaming sounds like a courtroom game, and <laughs> everyone was like, "That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we will happily do Changeling in court." <laughs> so when we did C twenty, I tried to convince Rich to let us do Laws of the Dreaming, and he's like, "We don't really do the Mind's Eye Theater anymore. That's by Night Studios now." Yeah. I'm like, ah, oh, dude, curses. Yeah. Um, Jason Lee did it, and uh, um, or Jason Andrews, sorry, and. I think I'm listed on that as a consultant because they had me mm-hmm. come and like read stuff and look stuff over. It's a very different take on change. Yeah. Like, you know, that's what he wanted to do. That's what Jason mm-hmm. set out. And he's like, I want to do something really different. I want to kind of shake things up and move the meta plot. And I'm like, Hey, cool. You know, like it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but if that, if you want to do a very different take, you know, here, yeah, I think that. it has seasonal courts. And, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of different elements in there. Oh, we've all done seasonal courts by now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we blend lost and dreaming sometimes. and We also have two comments, just for edification. Sure. Uh, Luis Armander says, My first Changeling book was Shining Host. I was poor, and this was cheaper than the Changeling one, <laughs> the Changeling court. It made me fall in love, and I started saving for more Changeling books. Mm-hmm. And then Count Clockwise says, the merits and flaws seem a lot more interesting in this book than the ones in C20, especially the Kith emulation ones. Endless (laughs) frustration is a particular favorite, (laughs) given how versatile and fun it is. (laughs) Yeah, like I said, the the Kith emulation merits were house ruled into so many tabletop games I've heard of in the years since then. People love them. And like, 
I mean, in C20, we had a very different philosophy going into mm-hmm. what we want to do. That's, um, uh, as you can, uh, as I imagine, a whole other podcast and a half for you guys. So, or yep. episode season and three. Half. Well, it's great. We could, we could just ask you your ideas without any like commitment to write anything. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we will get to it yeah we are we are getting there yep. slowly but surely yeah i mean that was a weird thing because that was such a dream team of changeling people who came together for c20 i had, mm-hmm. i had so much fun on that book um i was so starstruck because i had never worked with ian before and i was just like mm-hmm. a fanboy the entire time <laughs> and he's like i love your work i'm like <gasps> senpai noticed me <laughs> so, <Aww. laughs> And the and the thing was like people were like I don't know how it's going to do I'm like it's going to it's going to be a, a incredibly successful Kickstarter Changeling has a yeah. passionate fan base. Yeah. Um. And I was like because uh, like I said for years I've been telling people it is the second most popular White Wolf LARP by far. Like mm-hmm. Werewolf is a distant third, and like beyond that it's you know random little mage games or or whatever. But I was like Changeling the people who play Changeling love it and they will come out for it and like. My wife cried uh, because she got to work on Kithbook Boggan. And oh. she is a Boggan. Uh, we're a Boggan and an Ishu couple. And uh, and she's like, we never got our Kithbook. I'm like, well, Boggans just let everyone else go on ahead of them. You know, like, mm-hmm. oh, no, it's fine. You go ahead. Oh, no, it's fine. You go ahead. And she's like, it's our time, damn it. <laughs> it's finally <laughs> our time. And then I remember somebody was on the Kickstarter was like, when are we going to get Kithbook She? I'm like, you have like five books. Shut up. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you have books of houses, Stop lost lying. houses, and nobles, the shining house. Shut up. <laughs> Arguably the shadow court too. We're saying. Well, yeah. A lot, uh, yeah. A lot there too. Yeah, yeah. Like it was a meeting of like some of the people who had originally been in, involved in creating Changeling in the first place. And because like mm-hmm. Nikki and Jackie were involved in C20 and Ian was there. And then there were some of us who were involved later on. And then there were some people who had never played Changeling who were like brought in for fresh eyes. And like the C20 process was one of the most, some of the most fun I've had in like 30 years of writing game books. Like it was, it was so much fun. Well, hopefully we can invite you back to discuss this. Oh, I'd be glad yeah. to. I've had a great time. So do you have so, anything else that you're, you're working on or you'd want to shout out or have out? Or oh, like um, I mean, speaking of speaking of Ian, uh, I mean, lately I've been working on uh, for Ian on he works uh, he manages the Expanse RPG line for Green Ronin, okay. and uh, if you're a fan of the books and, and or the TV show, although the game is based on the books, but mm-hmm. if you're a fan of the Expanse series, Ian is putting out some amazing books, and I, he's asked me to work on a couple, and I've had a blast. So that's what I've been doing more lately. So. Yeah. He's a gentleman and a scholar and one of the best developers I've ever worked for. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I want to work on more Expanse books. Hi, Ian. Um, but, <laughs> well, uh, do you have any uh, any websites or social media that you would want us to shout out to direct uh, people to if they want really, to? Really? Uh, unfortunately, my website has been dormant uh, since before COVID. I just haven't mm-hmm. been able to update it lately. It's just my peterwoodworth.com, but... A link will nevertheless be included in the show notes for this episode. Thank you. For a fair warning that it hasn't been updated in quite some time. I keep meaning to do it and then not. So, mm-hmm. thank you for thank you for being again. It's it's an honor. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> oh, the the honor is all mine. I, bring me back anytime. I'd love to talk more Changeling. Sounds you know, great. And, issue yeah. or Shining House Players Guide or Book of Lost Houses or whatever. Um, and uh, you can find us podcast at changelingthepodcast dot com for email. You can. F- go to our website changelingthepodcast.com you can join our discord discord.me slash ctp you can send us a toot uh, at changelingpod at dice.camp you can follow our facebook changeling the podcast and that's it right i think that's everything (laughs) yeah (laughs) links again will be provided in the show notes and uh once again i'm josh the most recent court order still declares that I am Puka. And once again, I'm calling Fair Escape. Ah, fair Escape. Fair Escape. Spirit Pathways, I'm out. <laughs> Before participating in a LARP, we encourage listeners to practice a check in and follow these basic tips for well being. Make sure you've had adequate food and hydration. Bring sunscreen if you'll be gaming outdoors, and keep your towel always at the ready. Safety pins are handy for emergency costume repair, and that glowing orb buried in the woods behind the library is handy for emergency reality repair. And for changeling LARPs in particular, if you think it might be a chimera, don't squeeze it without permission, for it may be a human, animal, or ill-tempered carnivorous plant. 
These tips and other ancillary fave-flavored content is made possible by our magnanimous patrons, Derek, Dorchadas, Jason Vines, Oreo, Ross Caboose, Sandjigger, Seja, and Terry Robinson. You can join this list of all-stars by signing up for our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash changelingthepodcast to receive a shout-out at the end of each episode. We also greatly appreciate reviews of our podcast on the listening platform of your choice to help spread the word about our show. Thanks very much as always for listening, and until next time, keep on dreaming. Here come the outtakes. So uh, this maybe is a, a point at which I'll mention Pete and I have met before. I'm certain that Pete doesn't remember, (laughs) but many years ago in the, the hoary yesteryear at the local mall, there was a a certain bookstore where I had a family member who was working and, you know, was over there. I was probably 14 at the time. And I think I probably had the second edition core book and that was about it. And said family member was like, oh yeah, this is Pete, you know, and we probably had about 60 seconds of interaction because i think you had just got done work and we're you know going somewhere but i was told pete writes for changeling and it was <laughs> like if you if there were stars in my eyes like pouring out Aww. that was why and i believe at the time there was still um the shining host was still on the bookshelf with like a very proud little note underneath our own pete woodworth wrote this yep. book and i believe that's when i bought my copy so. I I believe it or not, I remember that conversation because I have oh, not sure. met that many fans in my time. Um, oh damn! So in terms of well, no, and just in terms of people, I remember talking to about it, and I remember I remember being at work that night, and I remember talking Changeling. So more memorable than you think. <laughs> oh, I'm glad the Miss haven't totally claimed that one then. <laughs> and that bookstore, which I then worked at, is now long gone, which is a very oh, disappointing. Yeah. Uh, turn of events, but moving forward.